Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. I know it's been uh, quite an adventure and uh, uh, quite a circus here with uh, what's going on in our lives and in our uh, professional and clinical work. Uh, it's been a bit of a circus what's going on with Medical Grand Rounds as well. <laughs> This is our fifth consecutive week of uh, trying to cover this hot area of uh, COVID-19 and keep you all abreast of uh, uh, what's going on. Uh, so we've changed the technology this time. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, this is a Zoom meeting. Uh, you as participants uh, will get on as viewers um, and should be able to see the slides, hear the presentations, and see little video images of the uh, panelists. Uh, but you will not be able to use your audio or your video. Uh, the way you ask questions for this is to use the Q&A button that you will see at the bottom of your screen. And you can type in the questions. We'll try to keep up with them. Depending on how the time goes, we might do a couple questions in between. But for the most part, we'll probably wind up saving the questions until the end. Um, and we'll try to leave a few minutes for questions because I'm sure there'll be some. So the topics we were planning to cover, uh, we're going to start with Dr. Lesho uh, giving his update on epidemiology and uh, community predictions uh, for what's coming over the next two to six weeks, although I'm told the accuracy is best for two weeks, and then we're taking it a week at a time. Um, Dom and Paul will then give us a brief overview of the ICU experience so far. Um, there's some points I wanted to make about COVID coagulopathy and thrombosis, so I will show Two slides, this will be very quick, um, giving you a sense of that. And then the rest of the discussion at the end will be Dr. Walsh uh, talking about the diagnostic tests and the uh, treatment options. So with that, I'm going to have Dr. Emil Lesho uh, start out, and this is uh, his uh, first slide. Okay. Um can everybody, it's just, I guess, everybody can hear me and see the slides, right? So here we go. Okay, this is a map that you guys see this map several times. This is uh, latest as of 5.30 yesterday. This is the, a map of uh, Monroe County. And you can see a couple of hotspots there, uh, you know, between Fairport and Rochester. Um, but the numbers there, about 800 cases. Uh, almost 100 in the hospital, 30, about a third in the ICU, and 57 deaths. Um, so that's kind of the latest. That number is going to be a little different. So that's the daily update from Monroe County Medical Society. So there's a little lag um, for the next slide here, because this slide is collated by the health department. But I just put this slide up to show, get a better picture of kind of the trend in positive lab tests. And, and the black line is the percent positive. And you could see, I guess, most of the time we're around 10-ish percent, seven to 10% of the tests ordered are positive. And you see, it looks like maybe around the 30th through the first was kind of a, a busy time. So that's the graphic representation. But now the next slide, I want to put in comparison. On the top, we have COVID, the COVID numbers. And on the bottom, we have flu to see how it compares. So again, because there's a lag, uh, those numbers in the table are a little lower. 
Uh, the actual new cases over the last 24 hours are on the upper right corner where you got 7,664. Um, and then on the bottom there, you see 57 deaths. And the numbers in parentheses are the change over the last 24 hours. But, it, but just for uh, comparison sake, if you look at the bottom line on the top table, you see, um, you know, 161 hospitalized for COVID. Uh, about 25% of the cases end up getting hospitalized. And you see 33 deaths for a case fatality of 5%. Now, if you go down, that's, that's basically about a month. So we've been at this, you know, the first case in the region was, was on or about the 13th of March. And you compare that from one October for the flu on the bottom, and you can see you got about 5,700 flu cases and uh, the hospitalization uh, and deaths, 17 deaths versus 33 in a month. And the, and the approximate, and this is what people had been saying early on, maybe it's, maybe it's twice, twice as deadly as the, as the flu. So I just put that up for comparison. Similarly, this is a graphic representation. So in the upper left is COVID. Uh, by the week, by the surveillance week, and the age and the colors. And you see 85 and above is really has taken off. But the only, the only group that it's really spared is kind of the really young people. You see every, whether you're 75, 65, or 50, there's, there's uh, cases happening. And then you compare that, that other line is the flu. That other graph is the flu. So that's Monroe County, let's drill down a little bit to see what's happening at the system level. From yesterday's evening's dashboard, you can see every, uh, you know, the by case, um, 129 patients discharged so far in our system, 14 deaths. And you could you see the rest. I, I think we've seen these slides a little bit before. Almost 6,000 tests have been performed um, in almost, Again, 10% roughly are positive. You know, 35 positive uh, in, in, in the healthcare workers or employees. So that's the system. Now, thanks to, uh, you know, uh, Tara Chen, John Hanna, uh, and the team here, I want to show you our little flow sheet of the RGH, or actually, no, this is the system. This is the first uh, 180 cases. So at the time that we closed this to follow up, which was April 1st, there had been 3,487 tests done. And at that time, about 2,200 results were available. And then you could see the breakdown, 206 positive. And we've had time to look at the first 180 of those, a really in-depth chart review, it's quite labor intensive. So it's almost half and half, non-hospitalized and hospitalized, and then they remained outpatient there, and then two outpatients died. And then we break it up by ICU 35 and non-ICU 53. And you can see the, you know, as it broke, as it breaks down. Right, I'll just give you a second or so to digest that. <clears throat> so that's the flow sheet. How about some demographic and, and other comparisons? This is just descriptive statistics on the first 180 cases. So total 180, again, outpatient, uh, the age of the inpatient was significantly older. It's more males. Uh, nothing else really significant until you see healthcare workers. Healthcare workers mostly uh, were able to remain in the outpatient setting, fortunately. Uh, so we had uh, not as severe uh, in, in the healthcare workers. I guess you could say that maybe they're Maybe they're healthier at baseline. Um, not much in the way of significant differences between COVID contacts or sick contacts. Uh, it doesn't show up on the subsequent slides, but the middle slide, the middle column is going to be outpatient, remember. And then the one before the p-value is inpatient, outpatient, inpatient. So then, <clears throat> then we have um, almost a significant difference, but not really in prevalence of CKD, hypertension there, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, consistent with a lot of the other reports, and cancer. 
Uh, how about medication differences, outpatient and inpatient? Um, inpatients were a little more uh, associated with ACE inhibition, acid suppression, and statin use. Now, again, I point this out last week, but there's more numbers this week. This doesn't imply causation or anything. This is just what was it, were they different, you know? And again, one example I could say, well, maybe red hair and green eyes were different. So you, you have to answer this with caution. It's just observation. And then finally, again, um, I have to go back and remind myself. Okay, middle one is outpatient again. And one by the P value is inpatient. So really no difference in time from symptom onset. And then not a whole lot about labs were, were different. Uh, you know, uh, the people who were admitted, I guess as expected, were more, uh, more commonly, significantly more commonly had an uh, abnormal x-ray and CT scan. So, so that's uh, total and outpatient compared to inpatient. So now if we go, let's, let's drill down on the inpatient. So we have 88 inpatients. Uh, 35 in the ICU and 53 not requiring ICU. And, um, you know, there's, you know, we thought, well, you hear a lot in the news, race, uh, but, but uh, not significantly different here. Not, you know, sex, poker, not a, not a lot of excitement there. At least I can, I mean, if somebody has other thoughts or comments, but that's, that's what we found, ICU versus non-ICU. So again, non-ICU is in the middle column next to the p-value. So Again, we don't have too much in the way of differences between comorbidities. Medication, no longer really significantly different. Uh, maybe some sick contacts. What about, what about time to symptom onset? Uh, symptoms to first emergency department visit. I mean, really, we didn't, we didn't see too much here in the way of differences, even with the labs. So I guess more to follow on that, or you know, if anybody has thoughts or questions or comments at the end, we're... We're open to ideas. So now I want to also give you, we're going to, we're going to slide as we slide into prediction before I wrap up my time. Um, the dashboard is continually being uh, improved to try to be more, more informative. And kind of to that end, we thought, well, you know, one of the most important things, Dr. Walsh was, was tracking this for us manually, but if we could see the number of new admissions in the last 24 hours, that really gives us uh, a handle on where we might be going. And um, chart on the left is the confidence limits, the chart on the right is overall the trend line. So the blue line is the number of new admissions for that day. And then the bar, the red bars are cumulative admissions. And so again, consistent with kind of what we saw a little bit, in, in maybe a day prior, you know, was the peak time around uh, 29 uh, March to 1 April, but it, but like like other epidemiologists or like what you may have heard on the news earlier this morning, where we use the term very we don't we don't we it's not really a peak situation. We're not really using that term for this kind of outbreak or this experience. It's kind of more like well maybe it's a plateau, hopefully. And so we try to the Donna Newhart and her team in conjunction with. Um, other universities, including the University of Rochester, based on all this other stuff, uh, you can see their, their assumptions and their def, def, you know, definitions that they put into all of these complicated modeling, and including the data that John, Hannah, and Tara were able to give them. Uh, the data that we just went over has used all of these uh, assumptions and parameters to make the projections. And as Dr. Patak alluded to in the beginning of the talk, um, it's coming out to use this, what, what you might be hearing is the quadratic or polynomial thing, which is fairly good at the first couple of weeks, but nothing beyond that. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't really show or predict a peak. And so well, I had to ask my wife what this means. This next slide, you may have seen this. She's an algebra teacher in middle school and high school. And so they, there, there, were, there were two models early on that they were looking at a linear model and an exponential model. And I was thinking like a lot of the things were, it was reasonable to think it might follow an exponential with, you know, an R of anywhere, R not of anywhere from two to four. So, you know, two people give it to four people and four people give it to four more people. So, but fortunately that doesn't look like it was. So 
as a baseline, on 11 April, there were 90 hospitalizations in the region, okay? And, and, and for 22 April, the prediction using the linear model is 157, and a week later is about 190. And that maybe is a little bit too optimistic, but the exponential model is, is, is frightening. Uh, you could see the numbers there. And so what, what they think that might be more accurate is this quadratic or polynomial model. And that's what I asked her, so what, what does that mean? And so if you're using you know, quadratic equations, it means that you're, you're not really having a bell-shaped curve, but you're having a parabolic uh, shape to it. So again, if it, it can either be a U-shape or an upside-down kind of U-shape with a, with a wide bottom or a wide top, how you look at it. And that's kind of the numbers that are looking at there with Newhart and her team. And on the right, the, the orange Xs are projected hospitalizations. The gray Xs are ICU projections. And then the, 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 the yellow plus parts are ventilator projections across the region. Based on, based on market share, what we can expect through all the RRH system. And people are still, this was one of the most widely used model, uh, the, the, the Penn Chime model. Um, and that's what they were looking at there based on that. Um, but what, what the team was also looking at is other similar regions. And one of the most similar regions that actually hap coincidentally happens to be seeing some of the same trajectories we are is um, Cuyahoga County in Ohio. And they're kind of using that as kind of like what's happening there is happening here and what's happening here is mirroring what's happening there. And so what that brings us all to the point is, I think the most important point is that social distancing is critical. And I think if we avoided disaster, it was because of that. And, and hopefully we'll continue um, to avoid disaster. It, you know, I can't overemphasize the importance of that. And um, epidemiologists predict that once these, these things are relaxed, you're going to see an uptick. And, and it's, just, it's just we hope that they're not relaxed soon and that the uptick that is naturally expected will, will be manageable. Uh, and with that, I'll turn over to the next presenter. Okay. so. Um, I think we can take a few questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, so Amal, uh, there is a couple of questions about flu death rate. Uh, I'll just read the questions. Uh, flu death rate is two per hundred thousand. COVID five per hundred thousand. COVID looks like twenty five hundred times more deadly, not twice as deadly. And there is another question. I'll did read. I get did I get the math wrong? Was it that new math that gets me all the time? Yeah, I guess it's early. Whatever, it's worse. <laughs> uh, second question on the same topic. We have been hearing that national mortality rate for flu is 0.1 percent, yet the rate is 2.3 percent in Monroe County, according to your slide. Yeah. Are those looking at different parameters? I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. It, it may be a different population, right? It may be older people that are being looked at, et cetera. I think the 0.1% is based on general population data, perhaps. Yeah, it might be. And another question that is about your data on race. Um, uh, there is 13% of population is represented by blacks. Why is representation in ICU almost twice as much? That's a great point. I didn't point that out. Let's go to our rate. I thought it was 16%. So based on the last census in Monroe County, I thought blacks were about 16% of the population. Um, and uh, so in the inpatient, they represent 19% on the inpatient. And let's go to the ICU. Um, where is ICU? Uh, 15%. Yeah, 26% versus 15%. Uh, um, yeah, I, it, you know, that's a good point. Um, we'll take probably a few more questions and then we will move on. Uh, the question was about uh, these models are likely from uh, without social distancing. No, they're with social distancing. And, and I think I'm on they the... Presume they presume the same intensity of social distancing, so that fudge factor that they put in is zero. And zero means maintenance of the current state, which is what we're doing now. Schools closed, only essential workers. Right. 
and and i think the new projections are a little bit more flatter uh, the projections uh, which were shown were from 7th of uh, yeah april. I don't, I don't, I guess I missed that one slide. I thought I had another slide. Yeah, I guess I forgot to put it in, but right. they are, it's right. more of a, yeah. So, so we might see a mini peak in a couple of weeks and then a stuttering course after that. And yeah. And what, what we all worry about, I, I think everybody is worried about this is what's going to happen in the fall. Um, because, you know, the vaccines won't be ready by then. Who knows what the trials are going to show. Are we going to have a, a double whammy of, uh, you know, a pretty bad flu season plus a SARS-2 COVID season, that, that could be very challenging as well. Another question is, uh, what's your opinion about pneumonias, which we saw in December and January, and those patients were flu negative? Do you think they were COVID? I don't know. I mean, I think Dr. Walsh and his team is looking at, um, have, is, you know, doing a lot of stuff uh, you know, uh, to to potentially answer that question, they 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 in their RSV. I'll let him comment, but I know in their RSV studies and in their flu studies, they have they 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 have a means of looking at that. And the, another question: roadblock to wider testing. Yeah, uh, I done done. Dr. Reedy and Roberto Vargas and 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 uh, you know Dr. Walsh and Marianne Fomica have done have done an awesome job at expanding here. You know, like everywhere else in the country, it's still not where we would like it to be. It, you know, all the, all the, uh, the epidemiologists say that in order to have a successful reopening of the country, you need really widespread tests and the ability to do contact tracing. I, I don't think it's an overstatement to, see, to say that the local health departments are pretty stretched to the max. They're not going to be able to do all this contact tracing and, 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 we hope that, you know, with each passing week, the throughput of the laboratory tests are, are, are going to, you know, stay stable, if not increase. Okay, why, why don't we move on okay. to Tom and Paul, um, so, the ICU update. Sure. So I'm going to go over some of the things which IT has done for us to give us a lot of information and uh, a brief data of ICU. Uh, which is being collected by uh, some of our residents, Jyoti, Mamta, and uh, some of, uh, some other colleagues. We we started collecting that data a little bit late, so it's not as nice as Amal's look. But this is a slide. Um, now we have a COVID dashboard. It's not out completely; it's still partially testing. Uh, you, you can drill down. These are screenshots, so I cannot uh, further drill down. You can see the Rochester General data, this is the patients on ventilators. It was 14 patients on 7th. A few days before that, we had 19 or 20 patients. And it's kind of continuously declining, again, going with the social distancing. And we are seeing uh, some slowdown on the curves uh, compared to the predictions. Can go to next slide. Um, this is uh, ventilator data. We were calculating manually, which is on the left side of the screen and uh, right side is the EPIC. We have tagged all of our ventilators and as the patient goes on or off the ventilator, we can track it. Uh, and on the right side, you can see Rochester General, which is green. It's the ventilators available. Uh, it was 33 and now uh, as of uh, yesterday, which is 14th, actually day before this slide was made and we had 43 ventilators. Um, and uh, so we are we are tracking. So we are not, uh, there was a question about, are we going to run out of the ventilators? I hope not. Uh, in these ventilators, we also have 23 anesthesia machines which could be converted. So with the curve flattening, I hope we don't have to go to ventilator allocation. You can go to next slide. Um, Typically in ICU, you guys all know we have two ICU teams. We currently are running three ICU teams. These are the numbers from last night. A few days ago, uh, you can see each team has seven, eight. Uh, and the slide bottom shows total MICU patients or the COVID patients which have been admitted to ICU so far are 37. Uh, we went up to 30 patients in MICU. We are transferring some of our stable 
medical non-COVID patients to ICU, uh, surgical ICU. So that's why we're keeping track. Uh, so we, we could continue. And the, just a brief demographics, uh, we have 37, uh, Mamta and Jyoti and a couple of their colleagues have analyzed about 31 patients. All of them are not included. We had five deaths in ICU patients. Uh, eight were discharged to home and uh, nursing home. And age group varied from 30 to 84. Next. Uh, 22 of the 30 patients, 31 patients required intubation. 14 have been extubated out of which five were deaths or terminal extubations and nine uh, did fine, went to floors and one or two are in nursing homes or uh, discharged home. Eight are still on ventilator. Two of those are still on VV ECMO. One may be coming off in next few days. The other one is still probably going to stay on ECMO. Um, Nine of 31 did not need intubation. And uh, we have extubated patients who have a prox on a mean uh, ventilator days were eight, one to 20. The ones who are still on ventilators, we can't say exact numbers, but to date they are 13 days on ventilators and five to 23 days. We have tricked two patients. This is a risky procedure and it's being done at bedside. Uh, just a little update. Uh, on the next slide we can go we don't have to play video we just received these are uh, these are actually a scuba company who used to, you know started making these these are uh, cpaps uh, which we call them tent cpaps so we are starting to use we got 10 of these shipped uh, day before and we have used it in one patient so far this is basically a cpap which is more or less closed circuit so less risk of uh, aerosolization and patients are much more comfortable. The first patient we put on used it for 12 hours without uh, a break. Uh, there is tricky to feed them. Apparently there is a window you can put a straw in and feed them. So we are going to be using more and more. We sent some of them to Unity. Uh, we will send you a little YouTube link how it works. Um, and that's pretty much my presentation. Um, uh, and the, the patients we put these on is somebody who has normal or low CO2 and hypoxic respiratory failure. Typically, patient who goes on CPAP mm -hmm. is the one we are now doing it. We're doing this only in ICU, uh, and 5400 is now a ICU. So those are the two floors we're putting these patients on. So I'll ask one quick question. Initially in China, they were saying once you got on a ventilator, the mortality was extraordinarily high, like 90%. Um, in UK, that was much better. It was more like 60, 65%. And our experience seems like it's even better than that, would you say? Or? Uh, yes, uh, our experience is much better. I think we still have much more facilities than probably yeah. China had. And we have learned a lot of stuff, uh, you know, from when 15th or 16th of March we had first cases, we have changed the managed couple of times. Uh, there is so much data coming in. We are managing these patients a little bit differently. We have moved away from early intubations to continuing to keep managing these patients with either high flow uh, or, um, or non-rebreather, those type of mechanisms. Also, the hospital has made multiple rooms uh, negative pressure rooms, uh, in, and that has allowed us to use those type of procedures like high flow on patients uh, without ventilating them. And I think that's what is making the difference. Sure. Um, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about this issue of thrombosis in COVID-19 infection. It turns out that these patients, particularly the ones who get sick in the hospital, are prone to thrombotic uh, complications. And it can be pulmonary thrombosis rather than embolism in some cases. Now, people who are severely sick from sepsis can get DIC. The coagulopathy in this disease, though, does not seem to be a true DIC. The fibrinogen is usually normal or high in these patients. Thrombocytopenia may be there, but it's usually modest. And you see a slight prolongation in the prothrombin time. 
but the incidence of thrombosis seems out of proportion to the severity of the illness. It does seem to correlate with inflammatory markers. So people with high CRPs, high ferritin levels, and high D-dimers, whatever that means, um, are the ones who have higher risks of thrombosis. And so we're not sure if this is just sicker patients with higher risk or if there's uh, something we ought to be doing about this. So in the short term, we have developed this algorithm for anticoagulation in uh, hospitalized COVID patients. So as you see here, we're stratifying them into a lower risk group with lower D-dimer levels and normal inflammatory markers versus a higher risk group with high D-dimer or prolonged coagulation studies or a very high ferritin level. And so if you're lower risk with no clinical suspicion of VTE, our recommendation is standard weight-based uh, prophylaxis. Um, if you're high risk with absent um, clinical suspicion, we're thinking maybe you need a, a somewhat higher dose um, prophylaxis. Uh, some people are talking about full anticoagulation in this group. That seems a little scary uh, in the absence of a known clot. You will increase the risk of bleeding. Obviously, if there is suspicion uh, for thrombosis or if you have thrombosis or embolism, then full dose anticoagulation uh, would be the way to go. So just wanted to let people know that this is an issue that we are addressing in the admitted uh, COVID patients. And with that, I'm gonna transition to Ed Walsh, who I see has his microphone on, and there's his first slide. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, we would have been doing this last week, um, but due to the technical glitches, did not. So I'll talk about diagnostic testing as well as treatment. Um, and so, Brad, if you could move to the next slide. So I just want to show you what the treatment, uh, the uh, uh, diagnostic testing looks like. Uh, it's a molecular test, and at the top of this slide is the genome of this virus. Uh, this is a, uh, for those of you who have any interest in this, this is an RNA virus and it's single-stranded, and the entire genome is shown. Now, the, on the very right-hand side is a letter N. That has to do with the nucleocapsid protein, or gene, and it is that that is the target of the PCR that's done. So we have the next slide. And I'm showing you this for a reason, because I'm going to come back to it. So in doing a PCR, the very first step, take the RNA, as shown on the left upper, and turn it into DNA. And that's done very with a um, RNA polymerase. And um, this uh, DNA is then, the second step will be to replicate it over and over again. And what I show on the left, that little blue uh, 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 circle, or it's not quite a circle, oblong, uh, shows the strand of the nucleocapsid gene from five prime to three prime end. And to that, you bind a primer. Uh, and as you can see there, the G's will bind to C, the T's will bind to A, and so forth. And the polymerase will simply add extra C, G, A's, and T's to complete the strand. And so you get twice as much. And so it's much like the epidemic of the virus in that you have one strand and you produce two and then two produces four. And so it's an exponential uh, expansion. So let's go to the next slide. And this is what the readout look like, looks like as you uh, run this PCR. And this is the PCR that we've been doing here at the hospital for the first month of this uh, epidemic in Rochester. Uh, for this first month, we did not have any uh, commercial tests. And you can see that the, um, what on the right shows is what we call the CT value, which is the cycle threshold. And this simply gives you the number of uh, new DNA molecules that you've produced in the test. And on the left-hand side of that graph, you see uh, a sample that came up very early, meaning it has a much higher virus titer. And on the right-hand side, 
one that came up much later in the cycle. In other words, a cycle threshold of around 31. This, this difference here, for instance, represents about 128,000 higher virus titer in that sample on the left. And this is one of the ways we can learn how much virus is in a sample uh, that we collect from a patient. Um, I do, can you go back to that slide for a minute? All right, on the left lower, it says presumptive positive. And the reason this is saying presumptive positive on these earlier tests that we did for the first month is because we had to receive emergency expedited approval to do these tests and they are not FDA approved. Uh, normally we would have to have FDA approval, but because of the fact that Rochester did not have any testing uh, for at least two weeks into this epidemic, and, and in the Rochester general case, for four weeks into this epidemic, uh, we had to do this on an emergency basis. And now we'll move to the next slide. All right, so, so in the first four weeks, which began on 314 and is ending now, uh, we had a capacity of between 88 and 132 samples per day. And the turnaround time was generally between eight and 24 hours. And over this month, we did roughly 2,100 tests at RGH. Uh, these were essentially uh, all the hospitalized patients in the RRHS system, all five hospitals, and emergency room patients who were seen and either admitted or, or uh, released from the emergency room. As Emil had pointed out, over this period of time, we had 230 positives, which was about a 12% positive rate uh, in these tests. Um, in addition to that, there were uh, several hundred drive-through and outpatient lab samples that were sent to outside commercial labs. Unfortunately, the turnaround time on those ranged from four to seven days, and actually even sometimes as long as 10 days. Uh, so the information that was gleaned from those tests uh, was not particularly helpful, uh, but it did increase the number of patients who we knew had coronavirus infection. Um, the rate of positivity in that group was a little lower than the 12%, uh, perhaps down around eight or 9%. So what are we doing currently? We finally, uh, last week for the first time, uh, or on Friday got in automated testing. And so this week, tests are being done uh, at ACM labs and at RGH uh, using automated uh, platforms. We have three of them, but our capacity is still quite limited to about 270, maybe a few more uh, per day. Now that's substantially higher than what we were able to do uh, previously, but is not nearly enough to open the uh, the Rochester region uh, if we were to relax social distancing. We hope that within the next week, we will go back to our standard platform for viral testing uh, because we have finally, uh, today, will receive uh, kits from uh, that system. And so we'll actually have four systems uh, available to us and should be able to run somewhere around 500 or so samples per day. So move to the next slide. So people are always interested in what the false positive and false negative rates of these tests are. The fact is we really don't know. And the reason we don't know is we don't have serology to confirm or dispute a diagnosis of coronavirus infection. Uh, until we have those, we really aren't going to know the false positive and false negative rates. But let me just point out a few factors that we know to be true with other viral tests, and I'm sure is true with this uh, virus as well. First, the sample type is critical. A good, deep, and vigorous nasal swab is important. Uh, one of the things that we notice uh, when we do these sample, uh, we do test for a human gene to give us a sense of how much sample was obtained from the nose or the throat. And it is quite variable. And uh, in order to get uh, a good sample, you need to be very fastidious in how you perform the nasal swab. 
The second thing, and this is why I showed you that genetic uh, information before, mutation of the virus could be an issue. And uh, what I show here is the same um, a sequence of the N gene from five prime to three prime. And in red, I've indicated two mutations that have occurred in the exact region where our PCR is attempting to bind to the gene. And if that occurs, the PCR no longer detects that particular virus. And so this is one of the real concerns about genetic testing, uh, as opposed to other forms of testing, such as growing the virus, which currently we can't do because it's a highly pathogenic organism and should not be grown in the lab. And, um, and second uh, type of test might be an antibody test. Okay, what is the sensitivity of the test? We really don't uh, know that either. We know that we can detect up to 10 particles of virus in our testing system. However, that does not tell us what we can detect in a sample from a human being. This is, would be in a test tube. Next slide, please. So this is the international spread of SARS and what the colors represent are different strains that is spread across the world. And if we go to the next slide, uh, this rather complicated slide is actually the family tree of this virus. And on the left, in the center of the, the slide, you see the beginning of that tree, which started in Wuhan, uh, uh, China. And as it spread, and the colors of the countries are given on the left-hand side, as well as the little balls on the right-hand side, you can see that the virus sequence, the, the strain, starts to mutate and change. And it's geographic. You can see there's clustering of the little balls uh, for the various countries. And you can see, for instance, in the red, uh, about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way down, you can see there's the U.S. strains, and you can see that U.S. strain uh, mixed up in, in the other clusters as well. And this probably represents travel. So this is something that's going to have to be kept in a, a, a real close eye on in terms of diagnostic testing. Next slide, please. All right, what about the antibody measurements? Yesterday, I think, or the day before in the newspaper, it was pointed out that uh, uh, ortho uh, diagnostics has a serology test that is an antibody test. Uh, there's been other companies that are also coming out with them. Uh, we will be doing antibody uh, testing eventually in the Rochester area. It's useful for identifying previously infected persons. Uh, clearly, this is going to be its major uh, use. Uh, in trying to get a sense of how many people in the Rochester area have been infected. <clears throat> and hopefully in the next several weeks, we'll start to be able to get data in that regard. Uh, it's also going to be very useful in determining correlates of immunity, uh, identifying possible vaccine candidates as well. By using the uh, serologic data, we can identify uh, which uh, target proteins in the virus might be useful as a vaccine. Although we, we pretty much know what they are at this point, uh, but it'll give us a, a confirmation of that. Next slide, please. I just wanna point out that we're going to be doing a study at Rochester General Hospital in the se next several weeks. Uh, <clears throat> this is a vaccine study for coronavirus. Uh, again, I show uh, some molecular data here. This is the spike protein, which sits on the surface of the virus, um, which you see on all the slides and in all the pictures on TV. On the lower left, there is a little green piece at the top of that uh, protein. That green piece is what attaches to your respiratory epithelial cells and allows the virus to get into the cell and start and spread the infection. That little green piece is probably the most important uh, component of any vaccine that will be used uh, for coronavirus, uh, um, uh, to produce coronavirus immunity. Uh, it's been used, for instance, with SARS vaccines and uh, MERS vaccines. 
uh, and has been used successfully in at least animal models. Uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, to show uh, the um, plans that we have here. I'm sorry, next slide. The plans that we have here at Rochester General in the next couple of weeks will be starting. This is a, a Pfizer-sponsored vaccine study. It uses the messenger RNA technique, which basically is a piece of the virus for that spike protein and that little green piece. The idea is that uh, you inject it, the cell takes it up, and it produces the protein to stimulate the immune response. We'll be doing four different constructs, potentially, of this S protein. It's wrapped in some lipid. Uh, and this is called a phase one or two way study. And we will be looking at various doses of each of these vaccines. The age groups will range from 18 to 85. And as you can see, it begins very shortly. Uh, it's intramuscular. And the primary endpoints are going to be safety and immunogenicity. That is looking at the immune response to see whether these vaccines induce an antibody response that would be likely to be protective. This obviously will lead to phase two and ultimately phase three uh, efficacy studies that hopefully would start as early as October or November. Next slide, please. In the last few minutes, I'm just gonna talk about treatment considerations. And there's been a lot in the news about this and there's been not so much in the scientific and medical literature about this. Uh, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, Kaletra, which is a um, uh, HIV uh, treatment, remdesivir, and immune globulin. These are the things you'll read about uh, in the medical literature and, uh, and in the press. Um, let me move to the next slide. And I, hopefully you can see this reasonably well. The Infectious Disease Society of America yesterday came out with their recommendations on use of these uh, drugs, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, in treating patients with uh, coronavirus infection. What this sh slide shows is the two studies that have been done that would be considered randomized controlled trials. The first one, looking at mortality, and this is now I'm gonna direct you just to the red uh, box. In the hydroxychloroquine arm, there were 15 patients, all of whom survived. In the control arm, no hydroxychloroquine, the same outcome, that is, they all survived. So you couldn't estimate whether there was really any benefit. In the second bar, nope, don't, don't go to the next slide. Go oh, back. Yeah. There you go. Under clinical progression, the second row in, that, in, the, in another study, a uh, slightly larger study of 46 patients in each arm, you can see that there was a difference in clinical progression. And this was inferred based on reading of CT scans, where the hydroxychloroquine group had an 11% uh, response uh, and the no hydroxy, I'm sorry, this is progression, 11% progression versus a 24% progression in the hydro no treatment arm. However, if you look at the relative risk of 0.61 and you look at the confidence intervals of 0.26 to 1.43, this was not a statistically significant difference. And I'll just point out that in both of these studies, there were very serious uh, problems with randomization, with various biases. And on the right-hand side of this uh, table, you can see the recommendation in terms of certainty uh, and quality of these studies. And you can see that this was marked as very low uh, for both studies. And so that this has left us really with no information uh, about whether these drugs, or this drug is, is a value. Next slide, please. 
And this is a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And you can see there are two studies here. Uh, on the first row, it's an observational study in which there was no control group. And uh, it simply shows that uh, mortality was six out of 175 or 3.4 percent, which is exactly what the mortality rate we're seeing um, in, in virtually every part of the world at this point, uh, certainly not suggesting that this is a, a value. Um, the bottom row talks about significant QT prolongation, and you can see in that study, uh, in this particular study, almost 11% of the patients had significant QT prolongation with this combination of drug. The net result of these very scant studies is that the IDSA recommends only using hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin if you can enroll the patient in a clinical trial. And this has been a real limitation in our ability to learn whether these drugs are of value. Next slide, please. And I'm just gonna end with the most recent paper that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, compassionate use of remdesivir, which is a uh, polymerase inhibitor. And this was in patients with severe coronavirus infection. I think uh, Dan and Paul could maybe make a comment on this. They had 53 available patients and 30 were on ventilators of whom 17 were extubated. And I just wanna point out that what Damon Paul just said, we had 22 on ventilators, I believe he said, and 14 were extubated. Now of those 14 who were extubated, five died um, and nine were either discharged home or to um, a nursing home. Uh, overall, in this study, they commented that 68% improved their respiratory status. The very uh, somewhat complicated, but if you look at it carefully, uh, bar graph on the right, uh, it's an interesting uh, graph to look at and uh, to then use to compare to the experience, for instance, at, at other centers at, as well as at RGH. Uh, in terms of the outcome from this treatment. Uh, currently, remdesivir uh, is available only at the University of Rochester in a, in a uh, placebo-controlled trial, although we have uh, been given uh, permission uh, to uh, enroll patients uh, at Rochester General Hospital, which we uh, may be able to do uh, for patients who are uh, on ventilators uh, but again, we still don't know if this drug uh, really works because the uh, randomized controlled trials are not uh, available at this point. So that is my last slide and we'll stop and we'll take questions. So I'll go over some of the questions. A comment on your uh, this last slide. Uh, I think they had 68% improvement and we had about, if you say nine out of 22 improved, it's, about 40%, uh, so I'm not sure um, what to say. And I don't think we used any patient. We tried to get this for one patient, but he died even before we got the medicine. Some of That's this correct. is real-time data though, right? So some of your patients are still on ventilators and might get better. Uh, yes, so I'm saying the 22, yes, that is yeah. true. That, that's yeah. not full data. And I'm just seeing some of the people are asking questions in the chat box. Please ask questions in the q and I'm gonna go, try to go through chat box, but please don't use that uh, because that's not monitored. Um, I'm gonna go off over a couple of uh, ICU questions and then rest of those are ID questions. The ICU questions, some of them I've already answered, but I'll quickly summarize. Uh, we don't have much time. Um, so the question was if we should be using the inflammatory markers, CRP, LDH, ferritin. We are repeating those almost uh, every um, two to three days and um, seems to be helpful. Question about steroids. Uh, we, there is a very weak evidence of using steroids in these patients. There is a lot of data in ARDS that steroids are really not helpful, but 
um, current SCCM recommendation, it's weak. So uh, we are using it if patient is really at least moderately sick and inflammatory markers are getting worse. I'm not sure we should be using it on floor patients. Um, it's best to call a pulmonary consult before we do that. Another question about N95 masks. So far, we do have decent supply of it. Um, uh, and we are reusing and re-sterilizing up to two times. Um, another question on L and H phenotype of COVID patients. Um, we have learned that L phenotype basically means the low PEEP. These patients are not uh, behaving like uh, typical ARDS patients where we use high PEEP. Um, early on, uh, these patients have much better compliance than we expected, but they do progress to typical ARDS. We are actually rolling out a prone uh, vent, uh, positioning for patients who are uh, not on ventilators yet. I wrote some protocol last night. We are encouraging all patients to you know, lie prone as much as they can. If not, you know, left side for two hours, right side for two hours, sit up straight for two hours, something like that. Uh, I'm gonna move on to some of the ID questions. There was questions about repeat testing and how effective is that? Is it useful or not? The, the answer to that is really unknown. Uh, Emil and I are looking into the uh, duration of PCR positivity. And uh, in general, uh, about half of the patients so far looked at will convert to negative by two weeks, or usually that's about a week or 10 days after admission. But a good half of them continue to have positive PCRs. In general, in the, in the small number, relatively small number of samples where we've been able to do this, um, the titers seem to be going down in most cases. Um, and we don't really know whether the low level of positive PCR will correlate with, say, shedding of infectious virus that could then be transmitted. And this is, the, this is a very important data. Uh, the CDC has made recommendations about when people can come off uh, isolation, uh, but they're based on clinical uh, uh, findings not on uh, culture data or, or even PCR data at this point. Um, we're, we're hoping that over the next several months, um, not only our own data can, can help to answer that question to some extent, but, but that uh, other people will, will have that information as well. Any information yeah. on immunity from COVID and how long does that last? Uh, we have absolutely no information on it. Um, and, you know, people have used correlates with other respiratory viruses. I think it's fair to say that it's very likely to be similar to other vi respiratory viruses. And that is that immunity will be relatively limited. If you look at influenza, for instance, influenza with a new strain is worse the first time you get it, less severe the next time you get it and even less severe the next time you get it. In other words, you develop some degree of immunity with each episode and each episode is less severe. And that could very well be the situation uh, with this virus over time. So I would certainly not count on becoming fully immune. And this will be create a, a real serious problem uh, down the road because if you can become reinfected and even less symptomatic than we're seeing now, and we already have problems with asymptomatic shedding. Um, this will, this will uh, make it very difficult to contain um, the spread of infection with subsequent um, you know, waves of this virus. So does the spike protein change when you have the different um, mutations in the virus and different strains, does the spike protein stay the same? Well, the, the, this is really not known. Um, there may, if there are mutations in that little green part, which is where it binds to the receptor on the cell, um, if it loses its ability to bind, 
it will not be an effective virus to transmit or cause disease. Uh, and that sometimes does happen with other viruses such as flu. Um, those are mutations that, are that the virus is forced to make because of immunity uh, by the population. Uh, but it's unclear what, what will happen here uh, in, in, in this situation. But there will, there will be undoubtedly mutations. All RNA viruses have a mutation rate. Um, fortunately, this particular uh, coronavirus, or not this particular one, but coronaviruses in general, mutate less frequently than do influenza viruses. They tend to remain relatively stable over time. Uh, and hopefully this one will too. I think we can take a few more questions, uh, even though it's 9.30. What do you? Sure, sure. Okay. yeah, go ahead. So any data on viral titer and prognostic factor? I'm unaware of, uh, of that information at this point. Um, certainly something worth thinking about. It's, it's, it's worth also making the comment that it's very difficult to quantify how much virus a patient has doing a nose swab uh, because the ability to collect a uniform amount of a sample from a person's nose by a swab is very imprecise. And so it's very difficult to, to really quantify it. It's not like in HIV where you can do a blood sample or CMV where you can do a blood sample and you can you know, really quantify the amount of virus per ml of blood. Uh, this is very different. Uh, I'm sure there'll be data coming out on that. Uh, we're going to be analyzed. Uh, you know, uh, Emil mentioned uh, uh, John Hanna and Tara Chen uh, and the uh, data collection that they're doing. Uh, we're providing them the viral load, uh, that is the titer, uh, from all the patients that they've collected information on. And they'll be able to look at uh, to see whether there is a correlation with severity. Uh, I think you answered, but I was monitoring the question, so I may have missed it. False positive and false negative. Yeah, I think that was it. That was it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are we doing two pair of swab to rule out COVID? Uh, and I guess I have to ask, what do they mean by two? What What we do recommend, and I should have mentioned that in testing. Uh, it was on one of the slides. The best sample is actually a sputum sample uh, or, or a BAL sample if the patient's intubated. There's no question about that. Um, but for the usual patient, uh, a, nose, a nasal swab is better than a throat swab, but uh, doing both of them is the optimal way to do it. And when I do a swab on somebody, I do a nose and a throat, combine them together in the same tube, send it to the lab. A uh, question about BCG vaccination. Now, nothing about BCG vaccination and uh, coronavirus infection. I, I, I can't imagine why it would have any impact, but I have seen the, um, the speculation. Okay. Um, there are still a lot more questions. Is there any way we can email those back? I don't know the function. Yeah, I think uh, maybe if I can extract the list of questions, we'll try to summarize them, uh, send them to you guys, and send out to the group uh, some kind of group informational answer. So, um, and if there's an individual question for one of us, uh, maybe just email us directly. Um, and uh, I think we should end the grand rounds here and thank all of the panelists for uh, taking time out of their busy days to do this. I know they're all people who are on the front lines uh, actually doing a lot of the work here. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, I saw uh, about uh, 450 people signed on. I don't know if that was a true number. We'll go back and see uh, what the true audience for this was. Um, I, you know, so everybody, um, you know, try to stay safe. Remember that social distancing is definitely working. So encourage people around you to continue that, um, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, 
if uh, there's enough of a demand for this, we'll do something like this again next week. Thank you.